Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas, the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to improve your understanding of the entire ketogenic space. And there's something that most people don't quite grasp or understand, and that is the difference between ketosis and fat adaptation. Huge difference, so important to understand as you move away from doing a diet, which is a terrible thing to do, and make this a way of life. By the way, uh, as you listen to this, if you like the content at the end or sometime in between, hit the subscribe button. It helps us. And if you really would like to help us, make a donation through our Patreon account. We put these videos on for free, but it costs us a significant amount of time and money to produce them. I make no personal money from this, but I'd like to cover the costs of the production. That's up to you, whatever you can afford. Anyway, let's talk about the difference between ketosis and fat adaptation. Ketosis simply means having ketone bodies in your bloodstream. Now, ketone bodies are a fuel currency. They form a form of energy. They're a molecule made up of fat, beta-hydroxybutyrate, um, a, a subset, a little tiny block of fat. Think of it like pennies uh, or ketones and the dollar the big card is fat. So when you break the dollar up into little pennies, those are ketones. And when you increase the amount of ketones in your bloodstream, that's called ketosis. I could sit here and drink uh, eight ounces of olive oil and get myself into ketosis. And you can measure that by pricking your finger or by peeing on a stick, and you call it, it's called peeing purple or being in ketones. Keto Mojo is a, a great device that gives you both your blood sugar and your ketones. But all because you put fat in your face, it doesn't necessarily have benefit. Not right away. Because think about this. If you drive a gasoline car and on a given day, you now say, no, this gasoline's too expensive. I want to put diesel in my car. And you pour diesel into your engine. Of course, it's going to ruin the engine. It takes time. It takes time for that engine to be rebuilt so that it can use a different fuel source. In exactly the same way, your body, when exposed to more and more fat and less and less sugar that you put in your mouth, in fact, if you can be on a zero carbohydrate or close to zero carbohydrate high fat diet and you initiate that slowly so that you don't get keto flu and you don't have the rashes and all the other things, you slowly introduce that to your body and you slowly over the course of about three or four or five or six weeks transition from being a sugar-based consumer to a fat-based consumer and obviously protein comes along with fat. I'm not talking about protein. It always comes along for the ride. You can slowly transition your body to be in ketosis in a happy, healthy way where you don't get keto flu, you don't get keto rash. And for those people out there that say, oh, there's no, there's no bad thing from cutting out sugars. Yeah, when you cut out sugars, you get the keto flu. It's miserable. It is no different than quitting smoking. Try it sometime. Anyway, um, if you do it slowly, you can transition into ketosis. And now, as your cells become more and more exposed to seeing ketones in the bloodstream as a fuel source, those cells that can use ketones begin to use ketones more and more, and they down-regulate the enzymatic pathways that burn sugar, and they up-regulate the pathways that allow ketones to get into the cell through receptor-mediated channels, and they up-regulate the use of fat preferentially as a fuel source. But that takes time. That's called fat adaptation. And the, the measurable, the way we can measure that transition where the cells preferentially no longer use sugar, but prefer to use fat, we measure that by checking your insulin. Because insulin resistance is what the body uses to protect itself against sugar. There's a whole video on that. And as your insulin numbers come down, it means your cell at first is not afraid of using, and I'm afraid in cells, is, but it's not trying to protect itself from flooding itself with sugar. And as your insulin content comes down more, it means the cell is using fat more often. And it doesn't matter whether the fat comes from your mouth or from your own fat cells. If you're trying to lose weight, then the ketones primarily should come from your own fat cells. And the most important thing there is not to eat carbohydrates. 
and slowly lower that insulin amount. At first, you feed yourself fat on a high-fat diet, which maintains ketosis because you're so still so insulin resistant, that fat struggles to get broken down from your own fat cells. Remember, insulin blocks the mobilization of fat. But as your insulin levels come down, now your body will use its own fat more readily. So at first, you want to be on a close to zero carbohydrate, high fat diet to introduce yourself to ketosis. And you may not lose weight awfully rapidly. You lose a little bit of water weight to begin with. But then it stagnates a little bit, and then as your own insulin comes down, because it's your cells are no longer trying to protect themselves from this overwhelming sugar in your bloodstream, now you're able, because that insulin level comes down, to loosen up and release fat from your fat cells. So the transition is away from eating fat to now using your own fat if you're interested in weight loss. And then hopefully when you get to a normal weight, we don't have a lot of fat to give, then you want to start eating fat again. So it's important to consume a high fat diet to begin with to drive ketosis and then on the back end to eat fat as a fuel source because you don't want to use your muscles. And then in that in-between time, you want to have a little bit of fat so you're not relying on gluconeogenesis for fuel, but most of your fat needs come from your fat cells and that's how you accelerate weight loss. Fat adaptation is measured by a very low level of insulin. And I'll give you an example. I've got some, some blood work here, which I'm going to go through. I'll show you what fat adaptation looks like. And this is so important for our diabetics. I'm going to pull up, I've got a bunch of blood, because I do, we've done over 30,000 uh, um, sets of blood work, and I've got a whole bunch here. These are by permission from the patients. So here's somebody who is in... Um, fat-adapted ketosis. Uh, the person is skinny, normal weight, actually. Um, and what's interesting is, if you just look at her lipid profile, triglycerides are 45. Below 75 is where I want them to be. Her triglycerides are at 45 because that's really how she transports sugar that's being converted to fat. Her HDL cholesterol is 90, above 75. That's about as intravascularly healthy as she can be. But her LDL, oh my God, it's 268. Most doctors would be having a heart attack on your behalf. No, in the face of a low triglyceride, high HDL, those lipids are fine. What is she doing? She's in fat-adapted ketosis. She's transporting fat from her fat cells to her tissues because that's what she uses for fuel. Think about this. If you stick a needle in your car's fuel line that's going from the tank to the engine and you measure a lot of gasoline and let's say gasoline, let's say you've got a diesel car or actually, so let, me, let me flip it around, you measure gasoline, that's fine. You stick it in there and you measure diesel. Oh my God, it's a gasoline engine, it's going to destroy the engine. So all you're doing when you're measuring your lipids is you're sampling the fat in your bloodstream. And if the fat comes from excess sugar being converted to fat, that equates with harm. It's a marker of harm. But if you are in fat-adapted ketosis, you want your fat to be high. The worst thing she could do is put herself on a statin, be that as it may. So she's just transporting fat from her fat cells and fat from her diet to her body as a fuel source. She's fat-adapted. So absolutely fine there. The, just for, to pertain to this particular discussion... Now we look at her C-peptide and we look at her insulin. Well, her C-peptide is 0 0.54. 0 0.54. Most doctors, most endocrinologists, would immediately diagnose that person as having type 2 diabetes. Her um, hemoglobin A1c, however, 4.9. 4.9. Nine. And I'm just trying to find her insulin number. Her insulin, 1.4. Think about that if you're diabetic. She only has 1.4 units of insulin in her bloodstream. And this is fasting blood work. And then the other value as we look at is her glucagon, which is at 18. Her blood sugar... Let's have a look at this. Her blood glucose, 79. Okay, and this is early morning blood work. That's reflected with the dawn effect. Why? Let me interpret that blood work a little bit better for you. 
Okay, we started with the lipids and we want to see a high LDL in the face of low triglycerides and high LDL, uh, HDL. High HDL, low triglycerides, LDL, somewhere between 140 and 200. She's a little bit higher, which is fine. Her BMI, by the way, is 20.9. 20.9. She's an Olsen twin. Not quite, but a very healthy person. Her lipids are low. Her blood sugar is nice and low. Her insulin and C-peptide to maintain that blood sugar is very low. And her glucagon, which is producing that sugar because she's not consuming any, is also nice and low. So despite, because remember, insulin controls glucagon. So despite having a very low insulin number, her glucagon is also low. That is a vibration. It's very, very tightly controlled. And she is in fat-adapted ketosis. About as healthy as you can be. Now, we can talk about her inflammatory markers that are all great, her testosterone levels, her estrogen levels. All of those are in fantastic shape. And her A1C is below 5. That is fat-adapted ketosis. And one of the reasons why that's important is if you look at those numbers and you have type 1 diabetes, if you have type 1 diabetes, think about how much insulin you inject into yourself every day. If this person at 1.4, 1.5 units of insulin, a C-peptide of 0.54, is able to manage their lives adequately, why can't you? Yes, you may still need a little bit of insulin by injection, but there is going to be no gluco glucose harm to your body, which is really the problem with type 1 diabetes. That is a highly fat-adapted person. But all too often, we, we try to get ourselves into ketosis to lose weight. Weight loss only effectively happens and sustainably happens after you're fat adapted. And it takes between three and six months. It takes between three and six months to get adequately fat adapted. Where your insulin levels are low, you become insulin sensitive, you don't feel hungry, and your body preferentially uses fat, not sugar. And that is such an important concept to understand. So if you're on some little diet that lasts for eight weeks, or you're doing a study that compares two populations. I saw a really nice study the other day comparing people on a high-fat diet and people on a low-fat diet, but the study lasted for two weeks. It lasted for two weeks. That's like having a fart, not a bowel movement. It, it gives us some data, but it's not congruous with what we're trying to do, which is a way of life. If you can get into fat-adapted ketosis, fat is the place to be, and it takes time, it takes consistency, it has to be a way of life. And the only way to do, to do that is to drop the word diet from what you're doing and use an addiction model. Were you making binary changes? I hope that helps. We are going to talk in the next episode about how your body uses sugar and why sugar actually may be important in certain people. So athletes, watch out.